Good afternoon. <laughs> this Committee on Appropriations, Public Debt, Legal Affairs, Retirement, Public Parks, Recreation, Historic Preservation, Land, um, and General Government Operations will now come to order. We have several bills on the agenda, and two of the uh, sponsors are, are not present. So uh, let's just jump ahead, uh, and uh, we'll hear Bill 419. Uh, which I introduced, which is to amend Section 2, Part 1, Chapter 2 of Public Law 32181, relative to authorizing funding for charter schools. Um, I have signed up uh, Mr. Nishihara, Mr. Field, Ms. Alquero, Ms. Miranda, and Mr. Santos. Why don't we just add an extra chair and let's all come up. Um, let's start with Mr. Nishiha. We'll just go down the list. Can I defer to uh, the former senator? Oh, okay. Uh, I, I think, uh, Vice Speaker Cruz, I'll defer since I represent the actual Board of Trustees of the uh, Is there anybody Island here County. from um, the Charter School Council? Well, no frets from the AG's office yeah, now. So. Yes, I'll, I'll end. Since I'll so I'll you'll end. Yeah. Go ahead, Fred. Thank you, um, um, Mr. Chairman, members of the uh, Senate. Fred Nishi here, but I'm here in my personal capacity. And just, just for the record, I just finished a late OPA, so I'm on my lunch break, and I'll be leaving right after this. Um, I am requesting that the Senate support this particular bill. Uh, I think it's important for the, uh, basically for the students of the of Guam to have an opportunity to try something new. The whole intent of the charter school was to give opportunities not currently um, available to the department, I mean, through the Department of Education. And this is just a wonderful way to achieve that accomplishment. With that being said, um, the two amendments I would request um, that the Senate consider is, of course, the cap, the number of students. Right now it's set at 250. Um, if the cap could be lifted, my understanding from speaking with the school personnel is 358 instead of 250. And the other thing that I, I took a look at is the fact that the, uh, um, the amount of funding is good during school year 2014, 2015. Um, depends on how you look at it. It doesn't cover summer school, but for sure it doesn't cover the beginning of uh, August through September 30th. So perhaps, and I, I don't know the background of, of how the budget bill ran, but certainly I was, I was uh, thinking that an appropriate amendment would be for FY 2015. In other words, to ensure uh, there's uh, funding coverage through the end of this fiscal year. Um, that's the only two things I had, and thank you for your time. Thank, thank you. I understand you have to run back to the OP. Do any of you have questions, sir? No? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't want you, uh, I want that procurement to be resolved soon, so. Go. Mr. Field? Um, yeah, I'm. Just slide the, slide the microphone closer okay. and introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Daniel Field. I'm a former resident of GIGO, and I know that GIGO has one of the most populated parts of the island, and that with iLearn, we should give them a chance to uh, invest in our future, the children, the, you know, okay. That's all I have. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Uh, Carroll. Hi, my name is Rachel Alquero. And I'm in support of this bill. Um, I agree completely with attorney friend Nishihiro when he expressed um, that I think it is important for the children and the students of Guam to have an opportunity to um, 
experience a different kind of education outside of um, the public school system, how it's being run right now, uh, and it would be an amazing opportunity for for the children of Guatemala. Thank you. Miss Miranda? Hi, um, I'm Yvonne Miranda, and I'm in support of the bill. I have two children of my own, and um, one in elementary, and I'm, I do believe that with this modern technology, they'll be able to learn at a different kind of level than what they're learning now. Thank you. Mr. Santos. Mr. Santos. Senator. Thank you. Um, Vice Speaker Cruz, we have written testimony uh, to submit, and I'm not sure if you just wanted me to read this into the record or simply just have it uh, submitted for the Thank record you. and I would like to um, introduce the other board of um, trustees of the Ireland Academy. Be, be remiss on my part. Um, sorry, Dr. Paul Pineda and Mr. Gus Sablon uh, are the other board of directors, including Ms. Rachel Alcara. The other board of uh, trustee member who's not present with us today is Ms. Helen Nishihira, which <coughs> is Rachel and her represent the educational component of our board of trustees. So. On, on the written testimony, uh, Vice Speaker and uh, Senators Yamashita and Mr. Adat, we, we noted two changes that we would like to submit, and that's to reflect first the actual number of students that we project to enroll. The estimated capacity of our facility, or I'm sorry, our school, is estimated to be 358 students that we can enroll into our school. And on the second request is to replace um, on one of the sections to actually name the iLearn Academy, since Guahan Academy is also mentioned in the actual legislation. Uh, with respect to uh, Mr. Attorney Nishihira earlier, I know we've had the discussion on, on how to request or how do we adequately address startup funds. Um, I do recall during my tenure on the uh, Board of Education that we were Actually, we didn't approve, but we saw within the submitted budget the request from the Guahan Academy for startup funds for basically July, August, and possibly September for uh, some funding to pay for the salaries of, I believe, the principal and several administrators to begin the function of getting the school ready. We would hope that the, the legislature, when you uh, look at this bill because it does provide funding for the school, we can address that because we're, we're going to go to the same process. We need to get set up to, to actually prepare for the opening of the school. And we would ask that the legislature, as you deliberate and, and contemplate this bill, that you allow us also to receive funds to, to prepare for an opening of a, the new uh, charter school in Guam. Thank you. I'm I'm really uh, dismayed that there's nobody here from the council. I know we have written testimony from the department, but I, I don't have anybody from the council. Um, when your charter was approved, did it state specifically the number of students that, and how much did it state? What was, we, the, what was, what was on, the, on the approved charter? The charter included, I'm sorry, 358 students with okay. a projection to go up to 450. And then with the opening of our new facility in three years, it's, it's potentially 900. Okay, but the, but the initial approval 358. was 358. 358, on the, right. Can you um, have... We can provide you with the actual uh, um, yeah, application that we submitted to. Yeah, and the, a copy of, did, did they pass a resolution or anything? Uh, I haven't seen anything. Can you well, speak it? Yeah. Um, they did pass something, but there is no formal certificate or we were just there when the council met and they gave their approval. Should be in their minutes. Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah, well, that's, we'll, we'll have to find that. Yeah. Thing. But I, they didn't give you any kind of like a certificate that says No, it's just, approved you know, we're, we're happy to welcome you and thank you very much. And now we have to go to the legislature. So that's why we're here today. Oh. Yeah. Your advice. No. 
I put 250 because I thought that was what it was. But yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Vice Speaker. Um, congratulations. I think it's a, a great endeavor. Uh, we met maybe a year ago already. Yeah. It was a while ago, so I'm glad to see that you're uh, up and going. There's a couple of um, comments, I think, that were made, and maybe you could help clarify, Senator Santos, uh, some of them. Um, so, Mr. Fields, is, did I get your name correct? So when you said, you know, you're from GIGO and, you know, highly populated and so what I take away from that statement is that we're investing in the village of Jigo. Is that what you meant to say? Or more of the the children of the village of Jigo. Okay, so because when we had our first conversation we talked about this was really an island wide opportunity. So you're not closing this out just to the northern oh, ab absolutely not, okay. uh, Senator Yamashita. This is a public charter school open to all good. Yeah. And so you'll have some kind of first come, first serve, or the, lottery, or whatever. The, the, no, the, the plan is to do a first come, first serve okay. basis All right, on good. the grades K through five. Okay, at this point. Yeah. You didn't want to start with um, preschool? Uh, I believe we had the discussion, and we're pretty much waiting for if that is, in fact, going to be included in the actual curriculum moving forward for school year, I guess that will be 2015, 2016. Mm -hmm. And I think we had that discussion that uh, we were prepared to do that if that's going to be part of the core requirement for school year 15-16. I would, we, again, we've talked about this, and I would encourage that. And I know okay. that um, uh, Helen, Ms. Mr. Harris, Correct. is very capable of yeah. adapting. And it really starts at, at age three. It starts at age two. It starts at the beginning, right? Correct. So uh, that would be great. Um, robotics. I think a couple of you made a comment about how this is not offered at DOE, but it really is. In our gate program, uh, we offer robotics in different threads. Uh, the Department of Education has invested uh, great amounts of money, actually, in sending uh, teachers, mm -hmm. and they have come back, and they have such great competition. But, but what you can say, what I would recommend or think about, you don't have to, but this is a thought, what you can say is that you're offering this to a wider number of, of children that are not necessarily identified uh, gate because perhaps this is the type of curriculum that is needed for the other intelligences to thrive, right? But it is, it is in the school system, and they do compete, and they do wonderful things. And so so I, I wanted to state that. Um, Senator Santos, I, um, I was looking, and, and I'm sure the Vice Speaker has a handle on this, but I was looking at Superintendent Fernandez's uh, testimony that was signed by Mr. Malay, and they had recommended that... Um, we find supplemental funding for you. That uh, that's exactly. We ask that supplemental funding be explored for the new charter school. I, so again, I'm sure that um, the appropriations chair has a way of, of looking at this and navigating yeah. it. But if you haven't seen that, that was I obviously haven't seen that. We've had conversations story. with uh, Superintendent Fernandez. I did get a call this morning from. Um, Ms. Telling Titano uh -huh. informing us that their their request, I guess was the right word, was can we ask that you guys seek supplemental funding? And I said that's not the way the law is written, but yeah. I would ask that, you know, the senators, if that's a possibility, sure. I, I yeah. don't, you know, I mean, but I certainly I, understand where they're coming from, but, you know, that's, I don't like to use the word, that's beyond my payroll, so I can only recommend to them. I, it's your payroll. Yeah. So I, again, we, we 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 understand where you know GDOE is coming from. That any time you start depleting funds from their already strapped budget, we can understand that. But the current laws that exist is it, it comes out of their budget. And that's correct. I've had this conversation with you yes. several years ago. That yes. uh, okay, but that's not really. But I think the intent from what you guys have established is this is a public charter school. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So that's that. Yeah. Public charter. Yeah, and um, Senator, there was just one other statement um, that I just wanted to say. I, I think it's great that uh, GAX um, uh, Trustee Victor Paris has submitted a letter in support and encouragement of yep. our second charter. Um, but I did want to say something on page two. He says that they can appreciate your prompt funding as GAX didn't get the same expeditious funding in its initial year when its charter was approved. For the record, uh, the first year that its charter was approved, and Mr. Paris was not involved mm -hmm. at the school at that time, uh, they didn't have a facility. 
So it was a, it's a different, I'm just saying for the record, Mr. Vice Speaker, it was a different setting. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, once we got a facility for GACs, uh, they did get an advance appropriation. That was worked okay. out. So um, I would think that we would give you the same kind of support. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator, uh, when, when do you foresee opening the ILEARN uh, charter school? Our, our we have a projected opening date of January 26, 27, 2015, and the clock is ticking. So, yeah, we're, we're, we have a big challenge ahead of us, Senator Tony. Yeah, so knowing that we're already in the last week of November, right, and not sure when Madam Speaker will be going yeah, in session for December, or are we going into special? Let's invite the chairman of the council. That we'll, we'll excuse the three of you. Thank you. Okay. And um, Rosa, <laughs> Rosa, stay. And uh, Victor, why don't you come join them? Why don't we hear both of your testimony, and then I think some of the questions that, that Senator Ada has may be addressed. No, let's. Oh, it's Rosa. Sure. Yeah, if we get their testimony, I think we might be able to understand. I, I don't know if they've had the conversations or you've had the conversations with them, but it seems to me the direction was given by the count overall court. So why don't you provide us your testimony, ma'am, Madam Chair? Susan Smasi. I apologize for uh, coming in a little late, um, but Buenos Tardes and half a day, Vice Speaker Cruz and Honorable Senators, Senator Aline and Senator Ada. Um, for the opportunity to submit testimony on behalf of number, Bill number 419-32. My name is Rosa Salas Palomo, Tauto Barrigada. I come before you this afternoon to support Bill number 419, <laughs> but with a recommended change. I am currently the chair of the Guam Academy Charter Schools Council, created by the Charter Schools Act of 2009. However, my testimony this afternoon is not on behalf of the council, as we have not yet had an opportunity to speak together as a group and um, present you know, to discuss the bill in order to submit to testimony. So uh, because that has not happened, but however, I have spoken with some of the members of the council and based on the contents of the bill, I find that they support the intent of bill number 419-32. Uh, with, with that, I, although I know that the council members share my sentiments, I am here representing myself as an individual council member. Yes, the Guam Academy Charter Schools Council recommended that Guahan Academy Charter School be funded at 520 students at 5,500 per student for fiscal year 2015, totaling $3,190,000. As chair of the Guam Academy Charter School Council, Schools Council, just last Monday, November 17, 2014, I transmitted the newest authorized charter school budget I learn Academy Charter School to the Superintendent of Guam Department of Education, as well as submitted a copy of set transmittal to the offices of the Speaker and the Vice Speaker. In the transmittal memo, I indicated that I learn Academy, the Council recommended funding I learn Academy Charter School at 358 students at 5,500 per student, totaling $1,969,000. Also, I noted in that communication that I Learn Academy Charter School would open its doors at the beginning of the second semester of school year 2014-15 in January 2015. This was a very important piece of information. In January 2015, three months of the fiscal year would have already passed, and the school would only need funding for the remaining nine months of the fiscal year, totaling $1,476,750, or almost $500,000 per quarter. This would take them through the beginning of, fiscal, of school year 2015-16, which would be August, September, which would be in preparation July, August, 
and September. Thus, my recommended change to bill number 419 is as follows. On line 10, change, quote, and 250 students for one in, from what other academy charter school to and 358 students for the iLearn Academy Charter School, unquote. At this point in time, iLearn Academy Charter School has been approved by the Guam Academy Charter Schools Council. Thus, it seems only appropriate that the specific information be included in the amendment. Also, there are no other petitions or applications before the council at this time. So there are no other schools that uh, can uh, be um, included in, in this um, proposal, in this bill. Please allow me to close with my sincerest appreciation for this timely amendment, but more importantly for your support of and your belief in alternative forms of education for the school children of Guam. Godspeed and happy Thanksgiving. Rosa Salas Palomo. Thank you very much for that. I think that clarifies a lot of questions. I apologize that I didn't rec realize that it was 358. I was having early discussions at 2.50, and in my haste to try to address it, I introduced it without uh, amending it to the 3.58, but we can make that amendment uh, very easily, um, and especially now that we have the testimony that the council, Charter School Council, has approved 358. Because uh, it's important that we, we deal with what you direct mm -hmm. us to do. I try not to do other. Um, and uh, with that, we'll hear Mr. Paris's testimony. We've had discussions, and so he's going to have to do some. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Vice Speaker. <clears throat> Senator Msita, then I read it. Uh, before I begin, I would like to say that my chairman, Mr. Roger Cooper, is just unable to be here today, and he asked me to testify on his behalf. My name is Victor Perez, and I'm a member of the Board of Trustees of Guahan Academy Charter School, the Treasurer and Finance Committee Chairperson. Bill number 419 proposes an amendment uh, to the current Charter School Act to provide funding for the newly approved Charter School iLearn Academy. The proposed amendment does not affect Guahan Academy Charter School. However, the Board is in support of the intention of the amendment as to provide funding for, this, for Guam's second newly approved Charter School. And it was news that she went, I thought that you capped it already, Mr. Chairman, at 250, and I put in some information uh, to assist us on our behalf, but being that you're looking at approving 358, I'm in full support of that number as well. <clears throat> Have you had a chance to read through it? Do we, you still want me to go ahead? <clears throat> All right. As you are aware, Gark's Charter was approved in 2010, but GACS did not open as a school till three years later in August 2013, when it received on April 1st, 2013, its initial funding for the last quarter of fiscal year 2013. The budget for fiscal year 2014 was at the same funding level of 5,500 for 515 students. And enrollment, which was less than the approved charter enrollment projection of 520 if Guahan Academy Charter School were to open in school year 2012-2013. As, GAS, as GACS progressed into its second year of operation, the board and management looked to its approved charter and moved forward to the approved enrollment projection of 680. However, our enrollment today is 600, 80 less than the 680, but 80 short of the funding cap of 520. If we were to accurately reflect the correct enrollment for GACS for school year 2014-2015 from its approved charter, that approved number will be 890 for this school year. The budget for fiscal year 2015 did not get transmitted to the legislature till August 8, 2014, 10 days before the first day of school. GAX had already enrolled the 80 students when the funding cap budget was being recommended by, by the council. The budget language was an amendment on the floor which was passed on August 19, 2014 and tacked on to Bill 269-32 as substituted. This was one day after school already started on August 18, 2014. The fiscal year 2015 budget eventually became law in September with the funding cap of 520 for GACs. We seek the committee's reconsideration to the funding cap of 520, and uh, I thank you. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Paris. Ms. Palomo, um, I have to apologize that I'm not familiar with all of the, the documents and the resolutions that you guys have. Um, I had a discussion with Mr. Parrish yesterday, and as I understand it, and I guess as testified by uh, Mr. Santos also, when the council approves a charter, it sets a, um, a cap on the number of students for a period. And it's my understanding from discussions with both of them that in that initial approval, you've also included increases of the enrollment for subsequent calendar uh, school years. Um, for, you've already testified that for iLearn, the approval was for 358 for the, the remainder of this school year, this, this budget. For the GAX one, um, can you recall what your approval was as it relates to what could or should have been the um, enrollment for the school year 14-15? Yes, thank you. Um, and before I answer your question, I'd just like to also recognize that one of our council members, Dr. Suzanne McManus, is also here uh, with her daughter to support us here. Um, the very first year for Guahan Academy, the enrollment figure was 490 students. That was in their enrollment growth chart that's included in the, um, the application, in the petition. That first year, they were, they were awarded uh, for up to 500 students rather than the 490 request that was made. The following year, uh, and that 490, uh, Mr. Vice Speaker, was for that duration of the months just up to fiscal year 2013-14, uh, which would have taken them up from, I think, for July, August, and September of 2013. And then the new fiscal school year rolled in with fiscal, well, the new year, the school year already came in, but the fiscal year for 2014 started in September. From September until the following September, which would be 2014, the, fi the amount that they were, the number of students that they were, uh, that the council recommended for approval was for 520 students, but they only had an enrollment of 515 for that first school year, the first full school year. The, then this particular school year of 2014-15, uh, looking at their enrollment um, chart, they actually should be at 520 students um, and when we had final we had a really uh, we had a discussion about this how these figures are determined because uh, there was also in our hands a revised petition application or a revision of their current petition and those numbers really increased dramatically increased the council was very concerned about the facility. We already knew that the existing facility that housed 515 students was already small for the population and to increase was just going to most likely create another problem. At that point, uh, senators and Mr. Vice Speaker, we did not know of the intent to go to to Trades Academy to rent space. Um, however, it was made known to me by the new Board of Trustees that there were 601 One. students, <laughs> and that was well over. But that was after the fact. Um, also in the process of communicating with the former um, principal and CEO, the council always made it known to her that the cap was 520 and that we were following the enrollment growth chart that was in the original petition. We have later, uh, later on, we 
we finally arrived at what the problem was, at least to me. And I saw that the council was following the original enrollment growth, which was in the petition that was filed, that we approved, and not the enrollment growth that was in the revised petition, uh, the revision that was submitted in August of 2013. Um, we've talked about that now. We, we, the current Board of Trustees and the council members now all are in agreement. I actually even sent a communication to the Attorney General's office and asked for a clarification. And um, the, basically the clarification, if we were following first year, second year, third year, in my mind I was following school years and not when the petition was actually approved. If we followed when the a petition was actually approved, the timeline for Guahan Academy would terminate come this coming, well, this year, <coughs> next year actually, in March or May, okay? Uh, but we were looking, I was looking at it and I tried, and I believe some of my council members also saw it the same way. We were looking at actual school years of implementation. So Guahan Academy would have been in its second full, is currently in its second full year of implementation in which the enrollment chart puts it at 520 students. And that's what we followed. Next year we know that the number is going to increased, increase. We also know that for iLearn Academy their numbers are also going to increase. Um, so I think that we have a better handle of the enrollment figures, um, and if, if anyone else is interested in submitting an application, I will make it a point that they look very carefully at their enrollment chart, their, their growth for enrollment um, chart that they put together because we do hold them accountable to that. And we have been talking with Mahan Academy as to how to um, make sure that for fiscal year 2015-16 that those uh, 80 stu 81 students that they currently have are accommodated. Right? Correct. Yes. You cannot imagine how wonderful it is that there is collaboration and communication occurring. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we've grown a lot. We have. And uh, we've learned a lot. And, and uh, probably people don't want me to raise this, but, but we know that we have to. And that is the situation of GAC still has a huge issue in front of it, uh, Madam Chair. And mm -hmm. that is uh, they're in an incubator space. And so this next year, it, it, we should already be looking for another space unless there have been conversations that have occurred that I am not aware of, and that's always, always possible. Uh, so unless that has happened, uh, we need to find a facility and determine what's going to happen after next year. So as you're talking about enrollment going up, and I don't know if they're going to move to Trades Academy, because I don't know about that stuff, right, or those issues, mm -hmm. uh, but that is a very big uh, issue, um, Mr. Uh, uh, Vice Speaker, on this, this, on the on the sustainability of GACs. And I know that you are looking, and I'm really mm -hmm. glad you're on the trustees, uh, Mr. Paris, because I think you, you're you very reasonable. And you, I think you are uh, seeing the monies that you are being given, and you're making it work. So I do appreciate that. But uh, Madam Chair, that's that's a huge issue. And mm -hmm. that's different from iLearn, because iLearn has a facility. And there are those kinds of issues that we're up, up, uh, up against are not issues that Senator Santos is going to be uh, up against, um, as far as I know. right? So I, that's something that is right there in front of us. Thank you. So the, would, would the council have any objection to my amending the law to put the 601 figure for this current year? Definitely not. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Can we add retroactive to the start of the school year? It's Christmas. Come on. <laughs> I, 
I do want to add that the atmosphere and the attitude has changed drastically. The fact that we can come to the table and not feel ang anxious about what may or may not happen, and be honest, because I do stress, you know, I can't read your minds. You need to tell me what's in your head so I can know and so the rest of my council members can know. And even in the few weeks that we've been coming together, we've actually come together a couple of times to talk about amendments to the law, and we have them with us. Uh, and one of the things that I'd like to uh, as share implement is maybe once a quarter meet with the charter schools representatives and just hash out, just talk. Maybe other things can come up before they actually happen uh, so that we can begin to anticipate and not react when something comes up. I know that for me, I am really, really, I'm extremely happy. And to me, this is a great Thanksgiving and Christmas gift. Thank and you. I thank them. Senator, um, what I learned is it, is that your, just the start out facility or is that going to be the facility for, you know, where we're not looking halfway down the year? Oh, no, we, we, we anticipate to be in a new building, which uh, we will be coming to you shortly because we're going to need some zone changes to reflect the property that has already been selected. It's right behind St. Paul School. I see. Where a brand new building will go up to house the next basically three, two years, two and a half years. So old. then the Jiggle facility is it's just temporary. Like a, in our in our facility again, right? Also. We don't envision being there by year three. Okay, and thank you, Senator. In their petition, they indicated that by year, year three, they will have a growth of about two six hundred students with the anticipated move to a larger facility. Okay, all right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator, um, you know we've referenced St. Paul's a couple times. Right. But this is not a St. Paul. Absolutely not. I think that needs we're, to be really, all, really clear. We all pray to the same God, I think, so right. we're okay. I mean, really, really yeah. clear. No, it's, it's clear. It's not a school. sectarian. And, okay. Yeah. I just happen to be Catholic, just not sure which one, but something along those lines. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so. Anyways, I, you know, since we're talking house cleaning items, and with all due respect to my friends at, at DOE, um, maybe it's time that you remove... The, the charter goes out of the, not sure if it's the purview or the supervision or the, not sure really what we were doing when we first got it. When I sat on that board, I, I said, it's very nice that you can give me a budget, but I have no oversight. I'm sorry, the board of, of trust, or the GDOE board had really it, nothing to do with it. it. It simply meant that, you know, you give your budget to GDOE because you're part of the educational system of Guam, but... Um, there was some, we didn't really know what we were supposed to do with it other than collect it and then give it. Uh, my conversation earlier with Telling Tightner was that, I said, so Telling, do you expect me to submit our 2016? She goes, well, it's part of the budget call. You should be working on it. And I said, okay, so understanding, understanding that that's supposed to happen, it be behooves us and the two charter schools to start preparing to submit it together with GDOE. But... I, I think moving forward, if we really want to satisfy what GDO is saying that, you know, if we're going to go be looking for our own funds, then separate us and we can come on our own behalf and come and plead our case before the Guam legislature when it comes to looking for our own funds. And, and I, I will be the first to tell you I understand the plight of GDOE because every single year they face the same issue of not getting enough funds to properly fund our schools. Now I'm biased because I want to make sure that we have funds for our school. So, you know, we come and do our own lobbying and pleading, and they should do the same thing. But I want one thing very clear. Sure. To both of you. You will answer to the aud internal auditor of GDOE. Uh, I, I do not want to hear anything come back to me that you refuse to provide documents to the internal auditor so, of GDOE. So, because these are government funds. I, these are government funds, gentlemen. And so someone has to have okay. oversight. And the internal auditor of GDOE will have oversight of all the expenditures to make sure that it's being done properly. And I will not tolerate anyone okay. refusing to provide documents to them 
so that they can look at it. Because yeah. they're going to be the one that has to say, this is how we spent our $178 million, whatever number, 115 right. whatever the number is. They're going to have to document it. And, um, and I know there's requests to try to figure out about the feeding and all kinds of other things. So, but really seriously, I understand that you will get your own federal grants separately and you will come to us to lobby maybe an increase in this 5,500. That's, that's both of your purview. But what I am saying is that as long as it's government funds, it has to be reviewed by someone and whether it, it, it may eventually be the OPA, but right now it is money that has come through GDOE. And so the internal auditor of GDOE must and should be apprised and be able to look at the books so that he can tell okay, what's so happening. Uh, Mr. Vice Speaker Cruz, I, I just have one, one request on that is that I, I believe the charter school law uh, requires us to do an audit also. So that's an, in our opinion, there's two types of expense there. The audit requirement outside with an external audit is an expense to us. If you're asking us to duplicate basically the service of an auditor, uh, you know, to us, it doesn't really matter which one. I just want to know if we can excuse the one of, I'm not, not bypass the one on the external auditor side because then we don't have to really pay for one if it is the wisdom of the legislature that the internal audit of GDOE is but, sufficient But I think as, as, as a not-for-profit or a not-profit, right. whatever you guys are, you would, you would want to have your own audit done outside, we, yes. separate from, because the questions that the internal auditor is going to be asking <laughs> is going to be completely different. And so you may, uh, to, as board members, to satisfy your own fiduciary duty as your Correct. board members, have your own external audit to explain to your board what, what, I mean, and the parents, what's happening. But as far as money going through DOE, I want them to have an, an answer because I mean, I don't want a third party custodian that we've had like for the last 10 years that someone's got to, to answer and somebody has to know where the money is being expended. Invoices and receipts and everything has to be documented so that we can follow it. And I understand that um, the internal audit is not an added expense to the charter school because that's just absorbed by GDOE. I, I, I would like to say that, um, in fact, just a couple of Mondays ago, the GDOE auditors were at Gohan Academy, I think almost all day there, looking at all the documentations, and the feelings and the behaviors of the past is no longer there. The Guahan Academy is up to speed with their paperwork, their documentation, and um, I thank again the Board of Trustees for, for getting a better, a good handle at what has been going on. And I don't think it's going to happen with iLearn Academy because I think that's pointed out often enough. Um, also, Guahan Academy has just been given their clear clearance for the 213. 14 school year audit, right? Correct. Yes, so that should be coming to your desk soon. And they are preparing their annual reports and all those that are due, maybe even if it's a few days late, but they have had a lot of work to do as a result of what has happened. Your lunch program, are you, are you officially in the school lunch program? Uh, we forgot the uh, data on the Trades Academy and that once that's completed, it should be in order. But I want to add that not, not only are we working well with the consul, we're working well with Mr. Cooper Nurse at the IAO office. Everything is submitted and no allotments are cleared unless they're happy. Okay. Um, that's wonderful news. The, the, um, so the oversight of the Charter School Council, and I only see this in the news. And I haven't, you know, we tried to connect a couple of times, but we haven't yet. Um, do you have a principal? That's forthcoming. Uh, so who, who is the lead of the school right now? <clears throat> uh, the Board of Trustees have taken an active role in assisting with the current personnel, and we're trying to move people from within, but the principal should come on board on the 1st of December. Okay. And, you know, um, it's a charter school. You do think, I mean, that's the whole point, is that we do things differently, you know, outside of the box, and just as long as the... the uh, Rules and regs are in place that students are learning, the teachers are teaching, and there's that support. But uh, it comes to mind, um, 
who ends up being responsible for that? And it might be the uh, the charter school council is responsible uh, to ensure that you know it's a it's good that you're there, and Mr. Cooper and so you, you're moving things are moving right. Um, but but what if you weren't there? Mm. What if things hadn't changed in the last few months? I mean, believe me, when it wasn't you, but when someone else was here and wouldn't talk to us in this room, it was just like, are you kidding me? And so it's, it's, that's why I said it's really good to see that we've moved forward, and that's a great thing. But it comes to mind changes who ultimately is responsible. If your principal is not at a GDOE school, we know the superintendent is ultimately responsible. Um, and maybe the board, maybe not. No, I guess it would be the board, right? But anyway, that comes to mind. And, and as you're saying, uh, Madam Chair, we're learning, and it's getting better. And I also, Madam Speaker, uh, is very uh, interested in amending the charter school law. We've been talking about that for about two years now. So we do have some amendments, and I do know that uh, her chief of staff uh, has um, uh, amendments that I'm sure next term uh, will be addressed. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Vice Speaker. You have suggestions. Please yeah. submit it to us so that we can make things, I mean, th these growing pains, uh, we'd like to be able to avoid uh, with the third and fourth. We hope to submit it before this year ends. Uh, we are actually on page eight of the document right now. Okay. Uh, and we will continue on Tuesday again. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Go ahead. Jesus Masi, uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Vice Speaker, I just want to thank the panel here for coming together and really working in collaboration and taking care of all the kinks. I do see some of the, um, uh, I guess, the support staff from from GAX, and I just want to say it is really important because as a lot of the parents continue to come and talk to us about supporting the charter schools, and then the second one coming up, I think it's important because you, you're starting to see the families and the parents coming together to support this concept, and it would be a waste if, if that collaboration doesn't come together. And now that I'm seeing this happen, I'm just going to say uh, we're here to continue to see what ideas you want to, uh, you know, what amendments that are going to be needed to make that change. Because like Senator Yamashita said, Speaker, we are the ones who have introduced this charter concept to make sure that it works, and we want to see it really successful. And what better way than, than to seeing you guys here and knowing that it's going to work, and I know that the support staff. Is, is also behind you. So for me, that's very important. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Vice Speaker, uh, for truly hearing uh, the updated status and the bill that's before us today. Beautiful. Senator Masi. Senator Santos, just one more question about iLearn. And again, we had talked about this, but on the record, um, those of us with disabilities are welcomed to yes. sign up. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Thank All you very right. much. It's very clear in the law that unless they're over their number, first come, first serve. I, I would like to add, uh, if Mr. Um, Chairman, if you don't mind, and Senators, that um, I will be asking uh, Guam Department of Education for the latest, as of September 30th, 2014, per pupil cost in the GDOE schools. Um, so the figure that will come before you when the budget is submitted will change from 5,500 to whatever that figure is, we still have to discuss whether that figure will be broken down by the elementary school level, the middle school level, or the secondary school level, or just get an average. Uh, we'll look at it from all sides and see, you know, what would be the best thing to recommend to the legislature, to their committee. So that's just a heads up. In addition to the growth in numbers, uh, we also anticipate a growth in the per pupil, pupil cost. Thank you. And um, my office has done some of that. And so if you want, just contact the office and they'll, they'll send you the information that they have. And then you're going to have to try to figure out whether or not you add in the free rent or the, the inclusion of rent, what, what you know. OK. Well, thank you very much. And thank you, Mr. Chair. Madam Chairwoman, thank you very much for coming and clarifying things. And I thank both gentlemen for working together. And uh, this was much easier than I thought it was going to be. So. <laughs>
happy Thanksgiving, and God bless. Happy. Thank you. God bless. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, on the agenda was uh, Bill 412-32CR uh, introduced uh, by myself, and it was uh, an act to rezone lot, uh, lot number 88, track 15, uh, 1536, uh, agriculture subdivision in the village of Barragata to a multi-zone dwelling uh, zone for R2. I want to share that I did... Um, receive a letter uh, from the um, seeker of this proposal and he said uh, that he shared that he wanted to pull the uh, bill off the agenda uh, because there was uh, some recent uh, information that had service in reference to this rezoning and EPA issues and wanted to just hold on it. So if I can, uh, not withdraw the bill, but take it off of the public hearing and leave it in committee, and, and hopefully if there's any other amendments or any um, concerns that have been addressed by EPA and land management, that if I receive the information necessary to move forward, then that opportunity will be there. And if it doesn't do it by December, then it would be, have to be reintroduced. So if I can just take it off the public hearing agenda today. Thank you very much. I did need to do another committee report. <laughs> no, you don't. We do have one other bill on the agenda, Bill 406, introduced by Senator Rodriguez. I apologize, Senator Rodriguez is not on island currently, but I would like to read into the record the sponsor's statement. Buenos and half a day. Bill 406 says 32, an act to expand the authorized programs to Guam Cancer Trust fund by amending sub section D2 and E2 of section 26603 of Article 6, Chapter 26, Title 11, Guam Code Annotated, provides for a minor but significant amendment which is fully in keeping with the purpose and intent of the Cancer Trust Fund, Public Law 30-80 as enacted. However, as enacted, the statute inadvertently restricts the use of grant funds by nonprofit and charitable organizations to only providing cancer care screening, treatment, and support services. The statute is silent as to whether education, outreach programs, and activities that seek to increase prevention and awareness of cancer issues can also be funded through the trust fund. Unlike cancer treating, screening, treatment, and support, education and outreach programs are not clearly seen as direct services, but many believe it should be in that these are integral parts of the battle against cancer. This bill provides for the clear inclusion of proactive education and outreach programs, which is usually a major component of every public health campaign. Without an education and outreach program, which is a proactive effort to publicize that service, it will likely be underutilized. Many cancer patient organizations focus on education and outreach to promote screening and treatment services, as well as cancer prevention strategies that could reduce the cancer burden on Guam. Collectively, all of these program components provide a vital role towards reducing cancer in our community. Without this authorization, organizations will continue to seek alternative funding for this worthwhile purpose, which is extremely difficult to sufficiently obtain. The provision to increase the limit on administrative costs from 5% to 15% in order to administer the funds and comply with reporting requirements is unnecessary in anticipation of the expanded programs to be taken on. Collect is necessary in anticipation of the expanded programs to be taken on. Collectively, the expanded authorization for the inclusion of education and outreach programs and the nominal increase in the administrative costs will have minimal impact on the fund, but will have significant positive impact at, in the beneficial services to be provided in our community struggle against cancer, which remains disproportionately high. I guess my bias is clear. We'll hear the testimony. What did I do with that? Oh, there it is. Mr. Kubel, Mr. Tanner, Mr. Cruz, and Arceo, Artero, Corey Chun, Karov, and Martero.
Oh, oh written. Oh, okay. Come on up, Pete. When did that happen? Oh, a month or so ago. <laughs> Good afternoon, Senator Cruz uh, and fellow members on the Committee on Appropriation, Legal Affairs, Retirement, Public Parks, Recreation, Historic Preservation, and Land. I come before you today to testify in favor of Bill 406. Uh, my name is Terry Kwaba, Executive Director and Co-Founder of Guam Cancer Care, a Guam nonprofit organization whose focus is to provide direct support services to Guam residents afflicted by cancer in the, in the form of providing patient navigation, financial assistance, transportation, screening, and early detection. First of all, on behalf of the hundreds of cancer patients uh, we have assisted and have assisted over the past three years since our inception, I wanted to personally thank Senator B.J. Cruz um, for your tenacity and fortitude in pushing the passing of uh, Public Law 3080 in 2010, which created the Guam Cancer Trust Fund, whereby over the past three years, Hundreds of Guam residents afflicted by cancer have benefited from this program and increased their ability to ask, access much needed care. Last time I was present in a hearing in relation uh, to the Guam Cancer Trust Fund, it was uh, an oversight hearing uh, called by yourself in regards to getting these funds available to the people who really need them. I would also like to thank Senator Dennis Rodriguez Jr. as well. He authored Public Law 3139 with the late Senator Ben Pangalinen which created the Guam Cancer Assistance and Treatment Program and today has authorized legislation to expand authorized program under the Guam Cancer Trust Fund to cover cancer education and outreach, which are key preventative steps in the fight against cancer and other non-communicable diseases affecting our people of Guam. These two lawmakers are true advocates in the fight against cancer here in Guam and I thank you for what you do for our people. Let us also not forget all the other members of the 32nd Guam Legislature who last year signed Guam Cancer Care has joined the fight pledge and continue to work collaboratively to approve laws that benefit our cancer community here in Guam. I thank you all for all your efforts and continued support. Guam Cancer Care's primary mission is to provide direct support service services to those Guam residents afflicted by cancer. We have made huge strides in doing so as more and more cancer patients are getting access to care. We are bringing down the gaps through our navigation program by bringing in free chemotherapy drugs through collaboration with stateside pharmaceutical companies, providing thousands of dollars in financial assistance grants to assist cancer patients to pay for their much needed care, or personally transporting cancer patients to and from their appointments. The bottom line is that we are bridging the gaps in services needed by Guam residents afflicted by cancer and eliminating any excuses they may have in getting treated for cancer. The issue at hand is not getting the resources to people who have cancer. It is using limited cancer trust fund monies for other purposes that are not direct support services to people with cancer, specifically for education and outreach. Of the over 800 cancer clients we serve, there is one distinct fact that I want the committee to know. A majority or over 90% of our clients are diagnosed at later stages of cancer, where the survivability rates are lower while the costs are exorbitantly much higher. With this being said, in 2012, Guam Cancer Care launched its screening and early detection program with the goal of getting more island residents, residents screened for cancer. Our aggressive screening and early detection program launched our Join the Fight campaign, reaching many businesses and organizations of, of Guam with a total outreach of over 50,000 residents. In late 2012, we had one of our youngest clients enter our doors, which was an eight-year-old boy with Hodgkin's disease, a form of lymphoma. That year, we decided to launch our cancer education and outreach program with an emphasis on educating elementary school children on cancer education and the need for physical activity as a key deterrence in the fight against cancer. That same year, Guam Cancer Care inherited the Strides for the Cure Foundation and continued to aggressively implement the Kids for the Cure program, which is making huge strides in educating our youth about cancer. 
In compliance with the intent of Public Law 3080, all education and outreach programs within Guam Cancer Care are 100% funded through donations and fundraisers. Although Kids for the Cure program is effective, the outreach to our community is limited given the funds that is available. In fact, this year alone, we are only implementing our K4C program in three of 26 elementary schools, reaching only 1,300 school kids. With additional funding, we can expand this program to do more to th we can expand this program to more schools with the goal of educating these students about can cancer so that they can take the necessary steps early in life to prevent it. Guam Cancer Care agrees with the intent of Public Law 3080 that Guam Cancer Trust fund monies must be used for direct support services with people with cancer. From a priority standpoint, Providing funding to those people who need access to care versus spending these same funds for education and outreach should always be followed. Given the fact that excess funds may, may exist with the Guam Cancer Trust Fund, and there is in fact a need to educate our island residents about cancer and to encourage behavioral changes, Guam Cancer Care supports the use of Guam Cancer Trust, Trust Fund monies to be used for education and outreach purposes However, we ask that it be limited to only 10% of all grant funds. As to maintain the intent of the law, which is to provide direct so support services for those with cancer. Again, Guam Cancer Care is in favor of Bill 406-32 and encourage other members of the 32nd Guam Legislature to vote in favor of the passing of this bill. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much and thank you especially for that last sentence in that second to last paragraph. Mr. Tanner. Off a day. Um, my name is Chuck Tanner. Uh, I'm in this capacity I'll be speaking for the Guam Comprehensive Cancer Control Program. Uh, Vice Speaker, Senators. Thank you for sponsoring Bill 40632. As you know, cancer continues to be the second leading cause of death in Guam in the U U.S. for many decades now. Compounding the issue is the fact that Guam has very poor cancer screening rates. According to the 2012 Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, Guam lags in breast, cervical, and colorectal cancer screening rates at alarming rates compared to the U.S. For example, in 2012, only 64.4% of women aged 40 and higher has had a mammogram within the last uh, two years, compared to 74% in the U.S. It is no surprise that data from the Qualm Cancer Registry reveal that between 2007 and 2011, the leading incidence by cancer site in women is breast. However, this shouldn't be the norm. The World Health Organization has stated that at least one-third of all cancers are preventable, and that prevention offers the most cost-effective long-term strategy for the control of cancer. Moreover, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation has indicated that preventive services can reduce the pre prevalence of targeted disease or condition and help people live longer and healthier lives. As such, many of our partners have shifted their focus from simply treating or managing disease to preventing it in its onset in the first place. We believe the treatment alone won't win the battle against cancer. We believe that it takes combinations of effective prevention efforts such as supporting health promotion strategies, targeting common risk factors for cancer and other chronic diseases, promoting healthy lifestyles such as obesity prevention, vaccination campaigns, and affordable early detection and diagnosis services that can significantly improve our people's health. We believe that expanding authorized programs to fund cancer education and outreach programs through the Guam Cancer Trust Fund is a cost-effective strategy that will benefit our community. The Guam Comprehensive Cancer Control Coalition supports Bill 406. Please act now and pass Bill 406. Signed, Jared Ivey, Vice Chair, and Chuck Tanner, Policy and Advocacy Team Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Cruz. Off a day, Senators, Vice Speaker. My name is Peter Cruz, and I'm co-chairperson for the Tobacco Control Action Team of the Non-Communicable Disease Consortium. The Tobacco Control Action Team of the Non-Communicable Disease Consortium is pleased to provide this testimony in support and expanding the use of the Guam Cancer Trust Fund to include cancer education and cancer outreach programs. The Tobacco Control Action Team represent, presents, excuse me, <clears throat> represents a diverse group of private, government, and nonprofit stakeholders who are working collectively to reduce the impact of tobacco use in our community. 
Cancer education and outreach is a key component necessary to reducing cancer incidents and mortalities in Guam. Data from the Guam Cancer Registry shows the cancers with the highest incidence, lung, breast, colon, and cervical cancer can be prevented or detected at an earliest stage possible if lifestyle habits are changed and if screening interventions are regularly practiced. Expanding the use of the Guam Cancer Trust Fund <clears throat> will, all, will allow those already engaged in cancer control to grow their efforts in improving screening for breast, cervical, lung, and colon cancer, and focus on reducing disparities tied to tobacco consumption and obesity. Funding for these areas are vital if we are to eliminate cancer in a major health concern for our people. While the Tobacco Control Action Team supports the use of the Guam Cancer Trust Fund funding in this area, we also humbly ask lawmakers to modify this bill <clears throat> to include the following. Increase the 10% cap on education and not reach the 30%. While support for these newly diagnosed is paramount, paramount, a greater emphasis on prevention and early detection is vital if we are to transition to a community that embraces the notion of preventing cancer or detecting it as <clears throat> detecting it at its earliest, most treatable stage possible. It is through prevention and early detection that we will be best decrease cancer mortality rates, particularly the one-third of cancers that are preventable. Second, earmarked funds specifically for the Tobacco Prevention and Control Program at the Department of Public Health and Social Service to increase the support of Guam Tobacco Quit Line and other tobacco cessation efforts. The Tobacco Prevention and Control Program is Guam's lead agency in tobacco control, and they are greatly underfunded. In 2013, 20% of the high school youth smoked cigarettes. In, the sa in that same year, 26 of adults were smokers, placing Guam in a tie for second place in the nation, along with Kentucky. Year-round costs to run, the, to run an educational media campaign in addition to promoting and operating the tobacco-free Guam quit line for youth and adults are high and federally, funded, and federally funds are limited. Available grant funds used for media and quit line services amount to a, approximately a dollar a person in prevention and cessation efforts. Third and last, revise the language in the bill from cancer education and outreach program to cancer prevention, outreach, early detection, and screening education and research. Consistent with the first bullet, this will help ensure that the Guam Cancer Trust Fund monies are used to support the most vital work, which ultimately have the greatest and longest term impact, decreased cancer diagnosis and deaths caused by cancer. We thank you for the opportunity to provide feedback on Bill 406 by implementing these changes to include prevention, early detection, and research. We, you will be <coughs> helping to improve the cancer control efforts that may not be considered direct services for cancer treatment and support post-diagnosis, but which will ultimately help to make our people healthier. We humbly ask that you consider the few revisions we, we have proposed that you think will strengthen this effort and that you pass Bill 406 with these changes. Mrs. Juice Masse. Thank you very much. Um, you're with Public Health and Social Services, right? Actually, you retired? Actually, with Guam Behavioral Health and Wellness Behavioral. Center. Yeah. How, how I, I'm much the co chair the for. You, how much between the two agencies do we have for? for uh, outreach and education. How, excuse How me? How much money is received by both agencies in, in grants? You know, right and now, Chairperson, I, I do not know that. Um, you know, I do the cessation efforts, and, and just by me being the chairperson for the Tobacco Control Action Group of the NCD Consortium, I, I'm placed here to speak. <laughs> okay, because I'm, I'm so, still trying to figure so out. And so I do the cessation aspects with very, very little um, uh, most of the most of the education comes from public health. Yeah, and and so uh, we I, do I, I very, know both very agencies little. have quite a bit of grants and well, not specifically for for tobacco or for for behavioral health and wellness center. Yeah, 
we'll talk offline. Yeah, yeah. Because when we created this fund, I had visions of being able to come to work and not have to find five requests for medical fundraisers mm -hmm. on my desk on a, on, a, on a daily basis. Yeah, yeah. Daily. And I had visions of being able to drive around Island without seeing people with signs on corners. Since the passage of this act, um, it's, there are more people out there asking. Um, I'm wondering, do you guys go out and find out which one of them are, are cancer patients or which ones you can assist? Uh, I personally don't. Because I'm, I'm trying to figure out why there are so many out there and why aren't they being assisted? Anybody? Well, I, I, I can speak for everybody that's out there that's soliciting, Senator, but... Um, I know that I've seen some that are our, our clients. Uh, our programs are limited to using the funds for accessing care. We don't, we don't, we can't give it to them to pay for food or to pay for their power bill. It's strictly accessing care. And there are some limitations to our program, although we do have financial assistance grants that go up to $7,200 per year per patient. Um, but Just don't get too close to it. But there's a lot of other needs that they may have, and we, we can't prevent them from soliciting for other monies that they may need that are, are not directly to care. But uh, we do our very best to try to get them access to care. Uh, there are other, we use a multiple pool of resources that we get them other uh, grant funding sources. Um, but I can't speak for the people who solicit in addition to what they're already getting to, to, for treatment. Well, well, that's what I'm trying to get at, is that if you all think we have additional money that we could be using for outreach, and I keep thinking that behavioral wellness and public health should be applying for grants for that, and that this was to try to assist people with their, their medications and the other things that are necessary. I mean, I was talking to someone yesterday, I didn't realize this, one cancer that the pills are nine thousand a month. Mm -hmm. They're more than that, sir. And, and I'm like, and so I'm trying to figure out if we have extra money, would it not behoove us to be spending it to assist them defray the cost of those those things and and somehow figure out a way that. I, I, because I just don't understand. I mean, so many of them that come to us have all kinds of different kinds of cancer. I mean, the ones at the heart and other things I understand that they're, I, I don't know where they're, where they get assistance except from, from us. But I mean, I, I know that a number of the ones that come before me are lymphoma and other kinds of, of cancers. And I'm just trying to figure out um, when I get those, should I call you guys and say, <laughs> They're here, and can you take care of them? And well, uh, we do have we do have that problem of still getting people who don't know that we exist. But we do our very best to assist everybody that has cancer. Um, but the issue is, we we I, I agree with you, and I I really truly believe in the intent of the law, which is to follow what you're saying is helping people with cancer and getting them access to care. That that's why from a can Guam cancer care perspective. We don't want it where if you're going to have to prioritize giving money to a person who needs it to access care or going out and doing prevention, priority is always the person who's trying to save his life. And so as it stands right now, there may be some additional monies that we, we can't just give free money to people who have cancer. That's not the intent of our program. But there are some limitations where in, we're not a blank check to, to cancer patients. We do everything we can within our, our, our program guidelines. And from my, my understanding, our programs is getting a majority of the people to get treated. But there are some limitations in regards to, we can't pay for your, your gas or your car payment or your, your, your power bill. 
and and there may be some times where they, they have to they need that help and, and maybe there are other programs but our program and the intent of this uh, uh, Guam Cancer Trust Fund is to access care direct support services so we are for it we are for the fact that if there's excess money and we want to do education and outreach I don't have any objection but I don't want to come there, there be a, to a time where I have to pick and choose and you know as you mentioned you sent me a letter a long time ago where revenues were reduced but if I have to make a decision to say this guy needs that twenty thousand dollars for co-payment assistance or we're going to go out and do an education program at the schools i'd rather give that person the money and we are doing that senator it's just we we see the need and we we are part of the cancer control coalition we are part of the ncd consortium and we see the impact uh, of what prevention does because it's like it's like you spend a little bit of money for savings in the long term because as that same public law 3139, the GCAT program, which only help around nine people. We don't want them to wait till the last moment where their bill is gonna be $250,000 per person. There has to be efforts made in collaboration with helping people that have cancer, but we need to take a proactive approach because I can't stomach seeing an eight-year-old boy coming into my office or, or stomaching somebody that, we always make the assumption that people are older when they get cancer. That's not the case no more. It's everybody and it's everywhere. And I agree with you to the point where with this G Guam Cancer Trust Fund, it's getting worse. There's more and more people. Are, are we open? Are we lifting the rock? And there's cancer everywhere on Guam. And our numbers are increasing dramatically. And, and I agree, we can't lose focus on helping people with cancer, which we're focused on doing, but also taking a proactive approach in, in, in prevention. If not, uh, tell the senator we had the hearing and uh, we'll be writing the committee report. And so the bill is considered heard. All right. Oh, don't take the baby away. Wait. Uh, we're in recess until four o'clock. Three thirty. Three or three thirty. Three thirty.